Hello there. Probably one of the biggest misconceptions regarding family films is that they are cheery affairs that deal very little with dark and frightening themes and images. Well, believe it or not, most of them aren't all sunshine and lollipops. A lot of them are sinister and scary, and that's actually a good thing. Ever since the stories of the Brothers Grimm, these sorts of entertainment have allowed children and parents to be scared in different ways. So, here's my list for the top darkest family films. Oh. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Now while each entry has become darker since the series grows along with Harry and the audience, only the first two Chris Columbus directed chapters I would actively call family films. Starting with Prison of Azkaban, it turned into a series of teen films and now the franchise is aimed mostly at young adults. But even when Harry and his friends are 12, the series still show plenty of signs of darkness. From the slithering basilisk, petrifying the students, to Roger Pratt's gothic-like cinematography, Columbus was not afraid of entering more creepy doors at Hogwarts. However, what really makes this a film that slowly takes on darker themes was in its social commentary on prejudice as Draco Malfoy's labeling of Hermione as mudblood was an early example where J.K. Rowling's story would lead in not only the books, but the film adaptations as well. Before their hormones began raging and they started wearing the latest clothes, this was certainly the most exciting and dangerous adventure Harry had in his early years. The next chapter of Harry Potter Where the past will return the struggle for the future of Hogwarts will begin. <laughs> Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Let us hope that Mr. Potter will always be around to save the day. Don't worry, I will be. The Black Cauldron. It's pretty well known by now that I'm not a big fan of this film, but you definitely see the artists at Disney attempting at doing the Tolkien-esque fantasy. They didn't do it particularly well, but the imagery used for certain scenes is still frightening even to this day, and the treatment of the comedic sidekicks suddenly adds for the distress of the story. I mean, when has Disney done that since? Oh, yeah. Anyway... Its Darth Vader-esque main villain was also a major departure for them, and its skeletal army certainly brings back memories of Harryhausen. It says a lot when the MPAA almost gave this a PG-13, and this was a time when those folks gave something like Beetlejuice a PG rating. Not a fan of the film, but I admired the animators behind it for how they took on this atmosphere, and this won't be the last time their work will be represented on this list. Tradition of Disney animated classics now comes the newest Disney spectacle of them all, The Black Cauldron. The Witches. Roald Dahl's books almost always have a certain menace surrounding them, and probably none more so than The Witches. While this film adaptation shook coated a couple of aspects of the story, it certainly didn't downsize the impact of the title Witches. Angelica Houston's performance as the Grand High Witch is beyond evil, and when she turns the two boys into mice, well, that's almost every child's nightmare. But the scene that most sticks out is when the witches peel away their fake, realistic-looking skin and reveal themselves to be awful-looking goblins underneath. Now, this film should be higher, but there's one major part that forces me to put it low on this list, and that's the final scene where the main character is turned back into a boy. Wow, nice work on ruining what could have been a great, meaningful ending. Infuriates me so much, I need to grab the book to calm down. That will save the world from the witches. You are in for a treat. We must stop them. The Secret of Nim. What happened to you, Don Bluth? You made the very sort of family films that helped destroy the notion that they're all sweet and cuddly, but then you made sugar coated, unhealthy works like A Troll in Central Park and Thumbelina. Oh well. His debut feature still showcased Bluth at his bravest as he attempted to outdo Disney. I don't think he quite got there as good as it was. But the fact that the whole plot unravels because of Mrs. Brisby's son growing very ill and the mice of Nim become who they are because of being injected by experimental needles shows there is a darkness among the talking rodents. Where courage is rewarded. Oh, thank you. A motion picture for everyone to share. 
Oh, the poor turkey fell down. I'm, I'm not a turkey. Big no, buzzer, no, where's no, our no, mother? Get down with me, you better child. Discover the secret of Nim. And rediscover the child in us all. Dancing there, why her smoldering eyes still scorch my soul. I feel her, I see her, the sun caught in her raven hair is blazing in me out of all control. The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Victor Hugo's books are hardly family friendly, so to see Disney adapt one of those stories and still keep plenty of his darker themes is impressive. It's hard to deny that Frollo is one of the most multi-layered antagonists ever seen in a Disney animated film. He thinks he's a good Christian man, but then he almost burns Paris to the ground just because he lusts over Esmeralda. The way this screenplay tackles topics of prejudice and the Catholic Church is rather impressive, and it doesn't feel added in for shock value, but rather to add to the story and themes and make the final result all the more emotional. The gargoyles aside, The Hunchback of Notre Dame is certainly one of the darkest family films, but not quite as dark as... Pinocchio. This is a very, very frightening film, and it's not hard to see why. The scene where Lampwick turns into a donkey does not flinch and show how horrible it is, and how Pinocchio's poor decisions throughout the course of the film leads to really bad consequences that help in actually making this probably one of the more realistic fairy tales ever made. Pinocchio is constantly in danger, and there are so many moments where Jiminy Cricket is close to being squished and squashed. However, the major thing that makes Pinocchio stand out among the other Disney classics is how the antagonists get away scot-free, while a hero constantly has one bad thing happen to him after another. Stromboli may have lost Pinocchio, but he still continues on with the money from his performance and torturing his puppets. Honest John and Gideon are probably still helping in dragging children to Pleasure Island, and the film is pretty blunt about how the children who've been transformed to donkeys were successfully made to work in the salt mines. It's even left ambiguous whether the monster of the whale died at the end or not. Nonetheless, that's part of why I like Pinocchio so much, in that it's unafraid of torturing its title character and leaving the villains be. Huh? What the? What's going on? Oh, I've been double crossed! Help! Help! Somebody help! I've been brave! Help! Please! You gotta help me! Poltergeist. Forgetting the so-called curse that apparently plays the actors from this film, this was Steven Spielberg taking the haunted house subgenre of horror films and applying it to the family film. In a way, there's a style similar to the haunted mansions you see at amusement parks that children love to go on. A lot of the scary things that happened to the family were heavily inspired by Spielberg's own childhood, thus finding a place in his screenplay. Bringing in Texas Chainsaw Massacre filmmaker Tobe Hooper showed that they didn't want Poltergeist to have just cheap scares and actually be legitimate, and it definitely succeeds as those images of the girl in front of the static television, a creepy clown, and the living tree injected in how craniums forever, and for good reason. And the games are over. Poltergeist. It knows what scares you. Coraline. Neil Gaiman's stories seemed almost heavily inspired by the stories from the Brothers Grimm, and that wonderfully dark imagery was brought beautifully and without sugarcoating by Henry Selick. This is not a cheery story, and they don't scale back on it. The cautionary aspect of it adds to the darkness, and can apply to the other films mentioned on this list, as beneath the perceived sweetness, there is something underneath that is more dull, and I'm really pleased with Selick not scaling back. Parents may have complained, but they seem to be lost in a nostalgia to realize their childhood films were also scary to the nth degree. And daring discoveries. I still have to find my parents to set them free. This year, when adventure comes knocking, choo, choo. <laughs> there are some doors that 
that should never be opened. Gremlins. I don't trust trailers, and boy did this film have a misleading marketing campaign. It was advertised almost like a close cousin to E.T. with a marketable, almost unseen creature, Steven Spielberg's name adjoining the poster, Christmas imagery, and a nice little romance. The final film is like Wes Craven invaded a Frank Copper production. And boy is it a lot of fun. Chris Columbus's screenplay is filled with the right amount of dark humor and the sort of story and little scares that enthrall children and terrify their parents, something that was parodied in the sequel. And if you thought the final film of those terrorizing gremlins and Kate's Christmas story was on the dark side, Columbus's first draft of the screenplay goes even further, with Barney the dog being eaten, Mrs. Peltzer getting decapitated, and one scene I wish could have made the final film where the gremlins strip McDonald's customers down to just skeletons but leave the hamburgers untouched. Gizmo was even going to be an evil gremlin at one point. Overall, Gremlins is delightful for almost everyone, despite the comedy and violence. Over the age of seven, anyway. But hey, there's a reason it led to the PG-13 rating. Billy, what are these things? Where do they come from? Look, I know it sounds crazy, I know. But in a few hours, you're gonna have a major disaster on your hands. And my pick for the darkest family film is... Return to Oz. The darkest and most frightening aspects of The Wizard of Oz from 1939 are the flying monkeys and the Wicked Witch of the West. But they are almost nothing compared to what Walter Murch did here. The film pretty much begins with Dorothy getting electroshock treatment, and that tone continues on through the rest of Return to Oz. We have the witch who removes the head, the evil gnome king, our favorite characters becoming stone statues, the yellow brick road being torn to pieces, and the Emerald City not looking so emerald, among other things. However, the part of the film that most gave me nightmares when I was younger and still freaks me out are those wheelers. From their crackling laughter to the squeaking of their wheels to their altogether creepy design, just watching their scenes sends a shiver down my spine. I mean, who thought these things up? Okay, it was L. Frank Baum, the writer of the original Oz books, but still. Seeing them brought to life brought nightmares to me and everybody else, and the fact that it was advertised as a sequel to the classic musical makes it even more insane. Ugh, I hate those wheelers so much. Please, send them away. <laughs> Are they gone yet? Oh.